Hello everyone. Um, is that better? Can people, is mic, you can hear it's amplified? Great. Um, so I've run out of Tim's two bits. So instead I'm going to give you a very, very short talk on a thing called Google CL. Um, I am a command line junkie. I dislike um, using graphical user interfaces um, and Google CL brings all of Google's normal services to um, the command line. Um, it's a completely open source project. Um, anything you can do here, you can download the code and look how it does it. So if you want to make your own app do any of these things, this is a great example of how to do it. Um, so, what's supported by Google CL? Um, basically, it creates a Google command line when you, um, when you install it, and then you use Google, the service, and the, um, the command line option to kind of do something. So, does anybody here use Blogger? We have one person, so this is going to be useful for you. Um, the rest of you can tune out for a sec. Um, you can use the Google command line to post a blog. Um, here's an example of just posting something with the title um, foo and the contents of command line posting. Um, that's this line here in the center. Um, so you can effectively edit it edit your post in Vim or Emacs on the command line, preferably Vim, and then you can basically upload your blog post to Google. Don't have to ever use the web interface. Um, that's the way everybody likes it, right? Um, another thing, calendar. I use calendar. If my calendar tells me to go somewhere, I go there. Um, I have no memory of what I'm supposed to be doing, calendar tells me. Um, so if anybody puts something in my calendar, like at midnight, I'll probably turn up somewhere at midnight. Um, but this is a cool way to add things to your calendar quickly. Um, it supports natural language processing. It's not great, but it's okay. So you can do things like Lunch with Jim at noon tomorrow will um, basically create an event at noon tomorrow which has the name lunch and invites Jim along to it. Whoever's in your contact list is Jim. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, a great way to quickly remind yourself to do something like before you go home, schedule a quick calendar event at 5.30 tomorrow to pay the bills before going home or something, or somebody on ISC says, yay, we're having a party tomorrow night. You can quickly add one without ever having to click through the calendar interface. Another um, great tool. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, That's just paging me. Um, so you can also do Google Docs. This example here basically asks, um, edits in your local editor, whatever the dollar editor variable was set to, um, your shopping list. So if you want to edit your shopping list in Vim, you type Google Docs edit, the name of the document, that will download the document, let you modify it, and then when you close the editor, re-upload it. Um, pretty awesome. It's a little gnarly if you've got um, lots of stuff like pictures and stuff in your thing. This is only going to download the text. So, but for a simple thing like shopping list, great way. Um, finance, I don't use finance, so I'm not really sure what the Google Finance stuff does, but I do use Picasa. Um, who here has like a bazillion photos? I do. So 
Um, this is a quick way to upload them all to Picasa. You don't have to deal with some stupid Picasa interface or anything. You just give it a directory and say, put these photos up there. Great. Um, really simple. You can create new albums. You can do all that type of thing through the interface. Very useful. And the last one, YouTube. Um, whoever, has anybody here ever had a really large video to try and upload to YouTube? Um, it's a pain because your browser like cuts out halfway through or all these type of things. This command line is much, much more reliable. You can post a video using the Google command line. Um, that's Google CL. Um, download it from um, like the code.google site. Um, it's pretty awesome and it supports Windows, Mac and a variety of different Linuxes. Um, there's a Deb there if you're a Ubuntu or Debian guy. I believe there's some RPM somewhere. Um, I'm not sure. There's a question about time zone help. Sorry? Uh, I can't read that from here. Um, I have no idea if it deals with time zone um, things. The calendar stuff will only create it in your own time zone. Um, thank you very much, and we'll go on to whoever's next. That was Tim. That's president of Slug. I'm Marganita. I'm just stepping in today. <laughs> um, my, my thing is that we keep it to a sort of quick, short talks, uh, five minutes each, and I'll give you a one-minute warning and then switch you off. So our next speaker is Honera doing um, planning alerts. Know the web address. How are you, everyone? My name's Hanari. Um, I'm a volunteer at the Open Australia Foundation. Uh, we make um, digital projects. We're a charity. We make digital projects um, that help people better engage with their environment around them um, and politics and all of that kind of stuff. And today, I'm going to speak to you about planning alerts. So planning alerts is, is one of our projects. We run another couple of projects as well. What planning alerts allows you to do is you put in an address. What's the address here, Tim? <laughs> so I put in my um, street address and It's told me, it's corrected that for me, I think. <coughs> and then what I can do is I can say now email me whenever there's new planning applications in this area. So um, you get to find out when things like the pub down the road is being knocked down or there is a huge um, new block of flats being um, put up. Um, uh, and then you can then um, click on one of the alerts and you can also now comment. So. When you comment on planning alerts, your uh, comment gets sent to the, the council in question, this one's Leichhardt Council, as uh, an official submission. So you'll be able to then hopefully impact the, um, uh, the, th that, um, that development application um, by saying, yes, I really um, support this, or no, I don't, I, I'd rather this wasn't built in my area. Um, all of the code that we use to, to build this site is all open source, of course. So you can go onto GitHub and, then, and download um, the Planning Alerts application, which is a Ruby on Rails based application. To get all the, the data into Planning Alerts, we need to go off to all of the um, different planning authorities. So there's, there's almost 600 councils in Australia. And to do that, we use web scraping. So that's where you write a bit of code that goes onto a web page, pretends to be a user, and then pulls out all the relevant fields into a machine readable format so it can discern between the address and the description and things. And to do that, we've got our own um, set of um, uh, scrapers that we, we wrote in Ruby. Um, other people have contributed other scrapers in Perl and PHP. And I thought I'd also show you about 
a cool project that we've just started to use, which is called Scraper Wiki. And I think my finger is. So what Scraper Wiki allows you to do is you can actually um, write web scrapers in your browser on Scraper Wiki. Um, hit scrape, and then Scraper Wiki handles going off to the website, scraping the data, and then storing that in a data store. And then they expose that in a really, really um, a nice API. They've got you know JSON and XML um, API to all of the data. So if I go on here, I should be able to go search for some planning alerts. The cool thing about Scraper Wiki is that because because these scrapers are public, like a wiki, um, anyone can see when there's a scraper that's got a problem, and then they can go and fix it for you as well. So th that's been an issue with um, our scrapers, is that we might, say, write them, and then over time the council changes their website, and then those scrapers break. And how can people in that local area find out about that and fix it themselves if hopefully they've got the um, programming knowledge to do so? Well, that's where Scraper Wiki comes in because it's so easy to find out when, when something's broken. So they actu it actually shows, since these are my scrapers, I'm sure there's some broken ones. Um, here we go. So here's one where there's been a problem with this, and Scraper Wiki shows us um, the history of the runs and what happened. So this, this time there was uh, an exception. Um, basically, with a lot of these council websites, um, uh, the <laughs> just scraping them, so just visiting the website will actually um, cause problems with some of these um, council websites. Um, so that appears to be what's happened there. I think that's it anyway. Oh, questions? Yeah. Great, yeah. Because uh, that's the other thing. Because when you when you live in a local area, you normally get um, you'll get those things in the mail that say, um, you know, there's a there's a development application just down the road. Um, would you like to object to it? But planning alerts allows you to create a much bigger um, search. So I think our default is two kilometers in in your area. So you get a, um, to to find out what's happening in a in a wider area. And obviously, you're getting them every day if, if that's what you want. No, that, that's only recent in New South Wales, I think. Um, but so th there's really patchy. Some some don't at all, um, and there's 600 councils, right? So some are, are, you know are under resourced. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to help them do something about that in the future. Um, some put them online using crazy, awful PDFs, and some put them online using crazy, awful .NET applications, and some put them online in OK formats. And there's only one in Australia that actually provides a, a GORSS feed of, of applications. Because that's another thing about our site, is that you can put that feed into Google Maps, and you get to see them all on a, on a nice little Google Map. And we actually encourage councils to, to go ahead and use our site and embed that Google map on, the, on their website if they want to. Which council is that? Um, the one good one? <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 here in Sydney, yeah. 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 And, then, and it's just you know, one hero that works there that, um, that has, has made that happen, really. The biggest problem is that um, a lot of a lot of the documents that you actually need to assess a, a DA are actually proprietary to the usage of the architect or whatever, and putting them up online, there's an interesting legal, like in terms of things like they're allowed to put up their, their apparently, it's so I'm told that they're allowed to put up the diagrams, but they're not allowed to put up the shadow diagrams because apparently shadow diagrams fall underneath a different part and shadow diagrams uh, can't be put up by the councils. Well, uh, yeah, dealing with government, I'm really not surprised about those uh, crazy <laughs> idiosyncrasies, but uh, the, some councils do put those documents online and, and, and some don't. It is, it's really patchy with that as well. 
Um, and, I, and, and yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, I know some councils have used that copyright excuses as a reason not to make this, this, this information public. Okay, you can introduce yourself. I just need to swap this out. Oh, right. Uh, oh, maybe I'll keep, hang on, maybe we'll have a quick change and we'll make you go last then leave that there, no, I'll do my talk. Excuse me. All right. Okay, we'll have a quick uh, change. We've got, um, Four more talks to go, I think. So M Mark will come and do his Linux talk when we move the lap this netbook. But we might go to Tom next to demonstrate what this netbook is, and then move off the stage and go to um, Mark and the Linux. My my talk and what I'm trying to do here is this should should be showing up now on the screen is to actually get the meetings to a punch to a schedule. So I've been playing with. Um, with a timer, so so you can watch whether I keep to time on my talk. Um, and what we've been playing with at Slug over the recent weeks and discussing is what's the purpose of the Slug meetings? Why do people come along? What what do we want to get out of it? And there's mailing lists, there's email, there's websites, there's social media. So there's all these electronic forms. Um, with e-learning, you can learn stuff. So we don't want to come here for a lecture. Um, and the other thing that is also happening is there's um, Tim and uh, Tim and James are working very hard on software for the Slug website. So there's another opportunity to collaborate online. Um, and occasionally you have a um, a face-to-face -face meeting. So Tim, Tim, James, and I had a sort of met at one spot, but then I think everybody just sat at their own terminals. So the issue is what you actually d need to do face to face versus what you can do in the comfort of your own workspace and then just communicate over email. Um, and today, of course, the meeting's being narrowcast. So we've got Patrick, who normally chairs the meeting, at home sending us his feedback over there. So um, how are we going for time? Oh, I've, I've scrolled off the... So I've got um, 200... There's a couple of minutes left. Um, so the question is what, what we actually come to the meetings for and what we get out of it, which we can't do online and electronically. The food's great, that's one thing. Anyone else want to propose other values of why they came tonight rather than just contribute online? And now, of course, it's going to get tricky because we've got the mic or the mic's out? The mic's there and the mic's out. All right, so anyone want to make suggestions of what they'd like to see in the meetings. Are you happy with today's format where we had the food first and then we're just going to have five short talks? All right. Nobody wants to say anything? Yep. I, um, you have to wait for the mic because otherwise the people at home can't hear you. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm Ross. Um, well, the reason, kind of reason I come along is to find out about things and be exposed to things and ideas that I didn't know that I didn't know about. Okay. Um, if I knew I wanted something, yes, I could track it down. Um, but the exposure to the community and other people's ideas and projects, um, well, that's a, a, a broad education and um, in terms of maintaining and developing skills, um, I think that's what what um, I get best here. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything for posterity? It's all being recorded and go on YouTube. <laughs> okay. I think one other thing that uh, we all get out of here coming live to the actual site is that uh, there's a lot of conversation besides what's actually discussed on as uh, a presentation, either before the presentation, sometimes related to the presentation, sometimes it's just general conversation over the the food, so I think that's the main thing I get out of it. 
Mark on Mark, Mark on stuff. Oh, one of the things I've found interesting is occasionally I've said, "Oh, I'm so and so who posted such and such," but there doesn't seem to be a connection between people who who are posting stuff online and who are turning up here. Does anyone else find that's a thing? Yeah, but uh, I think Grant 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 Parnell did an analysis one time and worked out that the the, the they're virtually non non intersecting sets. Oh, um, <laughs> they're quite different. Uh, uh, the only thing I will say about it is meetings are different, but anyone who's done any any uh, teacher torture or ed educational theory, some people respond to, to, to reading things on screens or viewing things on screens. Some people need need uh, face to face. Some people need uh, active uh, and having a variety of, of means of access is is probably important. It's um, I think all of us read large amounts through the week. Um, perhaps something of a different format is is, is may, may keep it may be a, an advantage. Um, and that that's a similar thing that perhaps we can try out different formats during the during the year. Just as a straw poll, who who here posts to Slug <laughs> activities? I read it. You read it, okay. Any other list? Hi, my name is Jason. I'm uh, happy to be here. I've always wanted to come to Slug. Um, my unique reason for being here today is that um, I saw that it, there it would be in the Google building, and I try to tour all locations as I travel. So I'm happy to be here in the Google building today. <laughs> okay, my talk's 21 seconds over time, so the next speaker's on. Tom. I have to confess, that's why I came to my first slug meeting, was to see the Google building. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, Give yourself five minutes. Uh, well, yes, oh. except... Um, <laughs> How do I restart the clock? Okay, now, my tab's disappeared, so I'll have to start again. Oh, pick up the laptop and show it. That's going to be a bit tricky since it's actually plugged in. Um, I posted a message to the list to say I'd bought a new Kogan laptop. Agora, is that how you pronounce it? Agora? It's named after a Greek um, shopping centre, I think. Um, <laughs> this is the under $500 laptop running some sort of Linux. Um, I'll put it back down again. Um, you can read the posting about the thing. Basically, um, a few years ago, my Windows PC broke, and I took the plunge and ordered a Kogan netbook running Linux. Um, and worked fine, but it only had a 10-inch screen, so the screen was a bit small and the keyboard was a bit small. This unit, let me find a my posting about it. Uh, uh, should still be. Uh, you can find my blog if you look for Tom Worthington and Kogan. Let's see. There's a picture of it for the people out there. Whoops. Oh, we've also got an ad there from Google, but anyway. Um, I bought a netbook, it was a bit small, this has got a bigger screen, keyboard works quite well, screen works okay. Um, they have um, three different versions. After I ordered the one with a hard disk and two gigabytes of RAM and Ubuntu, um, they then offered one which has a flash solid state drive, 30 gigabytes, except it was running the Google Chrome, Chromium operating system, which I wanted a proper Linux operating system, so I didn't buy that. Anyway, I, uh, I bought the machine, it arrived, works okay, it's your generic laptop computer. The interesting part of it was it had the Unity operating system. Anybody used Unity? There's a few people there. So, um, it was a bit of a shock for me. So this is a thing that makes it look like a tablet computer 
with great big buttons and shadowed menus and things like that. Basically, I had a lot of trouble working it, and any time... Why don't you ask how many people have tried to use Unity? How many people have tried to use Unity and given up? Quite a few. Um, it was a bit of a shock to me because I wasn't taking an old computer and installing a copy of Linux as an experiment. I bought a product from a company with the installed operating system and couldn't really get it to work properly. Um, some of the windows, when I tried to click on icons, it would simply flip. It wouldn't act activate the icon I clicked on, it would activate the one below it. Um, when I tried to scroll down, something strange would happen. Anyway, what I discovered, one of my colleagues came in and said, oh, just don't use it. And I said, well, I'll have to change the, sys the software. And they just showed me on the logon screen, where down the bottom, there's a little menu and you can select the classic no effects interface and it switches off the unity interface the other thing that happened was um, the computers claims to have a three and a half hour battery life i got about two hours out of it when i switched off the unity interface i got another 45 minutes out of the battery because it uh, switches off the graphical effects with the interface, which made it up, up to something more like a reasonable length. If I was doing it now, I think I'd buy the version which is $50 cheaper of the computer with the solid state disk and just install, uh, maybe install some more RAM, but install a new version of Linux on it. Um, the hard disk on it is 500 gigabytes 500 gigabytes, yes, um, and uh, more than I really need for my little carry around computer. Um, but in terms of the hardware, it works all right. And if you turn off that interface, it seems to work all right. Uh, hopefully they'll, oh, and the other thing is because it's got 11.6 inch screen, you don't really need the tablet computer type interface. And Marguerite is telling me I'm out of time. If you want to know more about it, um, you can look it up in my so blog. What else is different in the lower price machine? As far as I can tell, uh, the operating system's different. It's got a flash disk and it's got one gigabyte of RAM rather than two gigabytes of RAM, but it seems to be the same processor and the s basically the same hardware. They sell it in, two, in three different varieties, um, two with hard disks, one with the solid state disk but the rest of the hardware seems to be the same. There's a little panel on the back which you can unscrew to take out the hard disk and I think it's basically just the machine, same machine otherwise. Um, the only other annoying thing is the menu bar is silvered, it's shiny. I discovered if I sit in a lecture theatre at the Australian National University, the light from the ceiling shines on the menu bar into my face. So I'm gonna have to get a black texture and paint over the menu bar. Thank you very much. Ubuntu, was it running? Was it the older 10.11? I think it's 10.11. Because I've heard that um, Unity was much improved in 11.04. Yeah, um, maybe if I log out. Uh, and switch it on and see what, see what it looks like. Um, the dual monitor function on this seems to work okay. I can't get any of the power settings to work, but I oh know Margaret is going to tell me to. Uh, oh, here we go. There's the option down the bottom. The people at home are missing out. And the one I selected is Ubuntu Classic No Effects, mm -hmm. which switches off the, the fancy graphics. And the one I started with, I think, is just the Ubuntu. OK, are we switching computers? Yes, so you keep looking away at the computer then. And we'll go to, now we'll go to Linux if we can. Mark's got a new operating system. Sorry? No, Mark's got his own. Is that right? Yeah, Mark. I've got it on his as well. <coughs> That's the other interface.
Okay. Simon's talking about Linux in Japan and he's just setting up his computer. Oh, what's it done there? <laughs> Okay. Good evening. My name is Simon. Uh, I'm from New Zealand originally, but for the last 12 years or so, I've been living in Japan. Um, <coughs> can you all hear me? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I started using Linux in New Zealand uh, before I went to Japan, and I've been using it in Japan most of the time. Um, recently working with Asterix, open source phone systems. Um, I thought it might be interesting today just to quickly uh, go over some of the things in Japan. Uh, first of all, I just want to show you uh, a little bit about the market in Japan for Linux. Yeah. Ah, okay. And then talk a little bit about TLUG, which is Tokyo Linux Users Group. And finally show you a couple of the systems that people are using to uh, bring Linux into the communities in Japan to save money and, you know, just use open source. Okay. So in Japan... I had a bit of a look on IDC, research company. Uh, Linux is used, according to IDC, by about 11.6% of companies. So it is still quite small in Japan. In Japan, of course, you've got very strong vendor um, client relationships. So if Fujitsu or Hitachi say you should use Windows, then all the clients will use that. So um, until more of those companies start suggesting to their clients to use Linux, you're not going to see Linux taking off so much. It is growing though, um, and especially in the academic world, there is, like most of the, the world, heavy usage of Linux. Um, and local government is another area where cost cutting and um, measures like that have become quite important. Excuse me. So, the companies that are using open source, Apache is the main driving force there. Um, also, people buy new servers, then they would start to think about, okay, do we have to put Windows Server on there, or can we use Linux? Uh, and mail server is sort of the third most popular reason. If uh, we're looking at new projects, um, people who want to use open source, that can be a driving factor move from Windows Server to Linux servers. Um, the desktop or, sorry, I missed the top one, open source office software like openoffice.org is another sort of factor there. Um, yeah, moving on quickly to the community stuff. Uh, I think like, like Australia or New Zealand, there are quite strong Linux communities. Um, TLUG, which I've been going to for a while, is the main English-speaking one. Uh, Yokohama Linux Users Group, which is sort of south of Tokyo, is the main Japanese-speaking Linux Users Group. So it sort of divides on language. In Tokyo, we'll get about 30 people. Uh, Yokohama, I think, is more like 40, 45 people each month come along. Um, we In Tokyo, we get some Japanese people, but they tend to be people more interested in improving their English um, or who do have good English skills. Because I, I think it can be quite frightening to discuss technical topics in a second language if you <laughs> don't understand it. Um, 
the Linux users group, it's usually about the same number of people. We sort of start off in the evening and go around and introduce ourselves. Hello, I'm Simon. I've been using Linux for da da da. It does sound a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, <laughs> it's good. Another group I've been involved with is the Japan Asterix Users Group. Uh, when I was working for a company called Denphone, and when we started about five years ago using Asterix, there were two companies, I think, in Japan using the open source phone system platform. Now there's at least 50, so that's been growing as well. Um, but we get together and look at phones and other toys. Yeah. I got a little video here. Hang on. A um, little video from our president, the president of T-Lug, Ed Middleton. Let's give that a try. Here we go. Hello from Tokyo Linux My name is Edward Middleton and I am the president of T-Lug. We hold monthly technical meetings on the second Saturday of each month in the afternoon and nomikai or drinking meetings in the evenings of the third Friday of each month. So if you're visiting Tokyo, feel free to come to one of our meetings. More information can be found at the TLUG website at tlug.jp. That's it. He does a lot of cloud development stuff. Some quick photos. I think it's quite similar to here. We've started using, or as I was leaving, we started using Ustream to broadcast the uh, meetings on the internet. Okay. Let's finish off with three projects using open source in Japan. Uh, this one and the next one are both in Osaka. Osaka has had quite a bit of public debt, so uh, any areas that they can save money have been quite welcome to them. So basically they replaced um, the Windows 2000 machines they had in, I think, was it 20 primary and intermediate schools. So all the teachers' computers were replaced. Uh, they kept the hardware and then replaced the operating systems with Ubuntu and using OpenOffice, so moving from Microsoft to Linux there. <coughs> One area, though, they did keep Active Directory. Um, I think at the moment a lot of people are still worried about um, using Samba completely. I think Samba 4 might answer that problem, and that will be good. <coughs> There's another one in um, another city called Kitano City in Osaka, they moved about 200 PCs across within the local government. The last one I want to briefly look at is in the north of Japan. I lived up there for my first two years in Japan, uh, two cities over. And this project in Odate in Akita is quite interesting for me because it's an asterisk system. Um, what happened was the local governments amalgamated, so you had one large city and about five smaller municipalities. Uh, so they were looking at ways to save costs. They had an old analog PBX system, sorry, digital PBX system. So they went, they put in uh, their own cabling between the town halls, between the libraries, between the gymnasiums, the schools, so that they could cut the costs for communication. Prior to doing that, of course, if you wanted to call the library, you'd call via NTT which is the local telco in Japan. Um, they have about 500 phones in their system. Runs on two Linux boxes. Sorry, this is in Japanese. But, um, two Dell servers here. This is their main town hall. The local offices on the side here. Leaf lines between, or their own line between the offices. And you can see, again, this, sorry, this is in Japanese. I didn't quite have time to translate it across. On the left-hand side is the calls, call charges each month. So one million. Up here would be 10,000 US. I need a pointery thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a million there would be about 10,000 Australian. The red is 
previously when they weren't connected and actually that wasn't including all the um, locations I think and the blue is after they moved the asterisk system so they freed up quite a lot of money though they could um, obviously use that money in other projects um, NTT is funny they actually support things like this I think NTT doesn't actually see it as a threat so um, if you come back here they are using NTT uh, optic fiber lines for the outside outside trunks yeah that's Nakamura-san, he's the guy who um, dreamt it up. Basically a lot of these projects are driven by individuals like you mentioned with the city council. He had an idea and got a couple of machines and bought some phones himself I think and then tested it, took it to his boss, took a year to get approval um, and then rolled out the, the main system. Yep, okay. So I'd just like to quickly say thanks to Nakamura-san Ed, if he's watching, Jim, Gr Jim from T Lug, whose name I forget how to pronounce, he took the photos before, and the rest of T Lug. Okay. It's all for me. Is there any questions? Thank you, Simon. Yes. And Mark, I'll go to Mark Wheat. Thank you. <laughs> Um, if this doesn't come up, uh, I've got it on disk as well for a, uh, for a um, yes. A red one. You need to plug it in before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm just getting across to get the actual. You don't need audio, right? No. Come on. That um, yeah, that should be right. Uh, dash dash mode in the and let's see if we can need to that's a really weird mode and now, now I've lost everything where's that where's that uh do that press it again Is it this side of the back? <laughs> That's not doing that. We were having a f terminal focused, right? Yeah, that should do. You have to tick out anything else? No. I don't know what you did, but you managed to... Yeah, See, it's trying to put a screen up there, but it's a Can way wrong. Terminal? Yep, try Tom's. You can give a running commentary of what Tom would rather do. Make it more <laughs> interesting <laughs> on the TV. Yes, all that. <laughs> yeah, let's try plugging you back in. I should turn on the Unity interface and see how you cope. Oh, careful. Okay, well if I put the plug in the right way, it works better. Slide that, that one. Yep, that's good. Hey, look at that. I just plugged it in and it worked. Um, let's try Yeah, but that's got a, the most wacky um, screen you can imagine on it. So put your PDF on there. Places. 
was it, it, there it is. That one? Yeah. Should yeah. Should I do an ad? This this computer's brought to you by Tom W Communications, PTY L T D. <laughs> no. Okay, this is really meant to be a light-hearted talk. Last thing, last thing uh, of the month. But, uh, it's not meant to be. It's basically to, to allow people to, to see uh, see other 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 plans, other parts. Okay. So. Okay. So. Sorry. Okay, I suffer from a little bit of RSI. Uh, I've had, had to be doing dig, uh, digging ditches for the last 12 months and doing things like that. And never su I never suffered RSI before, but uh, di digging ditches and, uh, and computers that don't go together. Okay, so that if, if that's... Sorry. So that... That's a model M that somebody has um, improved upon. Uh, uh, whether whether it be, uh, that's actually a quite a reasonable keyboard to type on, I would imagine. I've seen a lot worse. Uh, Neil, St okay. So the important thing here is that I don't have any uh, professional experience here. If um, if if your body tells you something, listen to it. Uh, don't 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 soldier on, etc. Okay, in this talk, I'll be uh, I'll I'll use uh, three terms: control key, uh, shift key, and bucky bit. I'll use them interchangeably. I'll try and be consistent, and use the old school term of shift key. Uh, so if somebody could sing that uh, better than I can. Uh, I'd be a lot happier. So that's from the Hacker's Dictionary. Okay. So in this this talk, I pl uh, talk I plan to talk about th four main areas: a bit of ancient history, uh, uh, and examine the keyboards of the past and how they're influencing our modern keyboard. Some ideas at, at reducing uh, typing strain, and look at uh, function keys. And whilst they're an inferior choice, it's, they're still better than a mouse. Finally, I'll look at other keyboards and see if the, the grass is really greener on the other side. Okay, let's get on with it. Uh, the first part of the talk, main theme about it is the battle between the shift key people and the function key believers. Uh, Emacs is the, the, the most ardent follower of shift keys. Often battles in... Uh, Great battles in computing, such as between VI and Emacs, can be traced back into it, into geological history. The division between function keys and shift keys is no different. It, do, it dates back to a time when mainframes and minis ruled the earth. I, the IBM keyboard that we use today is a hybrid of both both worlds, which is perhaps why there are so many modern key, uh, keys on a modern keyboard that we don't that we rarely use. Okay, the old, old IBM terminal keyboards were meant to be used by, by general users, basically storemen uh, who, who were doing their ordering systems. If you're doing, it, doing that, then it has to be easy to use, and if you're going to do, uh, there's one thing that a shift key, uh, that a set of function keys ha uh, has that uh, makes it easy, and that is uh, the, the ability to stick a set of labels above the keys. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure if we flick through too many uh, screens there. So shift keys uh, come from from the artificial intelligence uh, uh, and Lisp users, uh, Richard Stallman and Co. These are people for which a, a steep learning curve was a challenge, and worth the effort if you improve your productivity in the long run. With a shift key then your hands are over the, the main key block more of the time. And so you can potentially have uh, faster typing speeds. 
Okay, the t high point of, of uh, this evolution was the Space Cadet keyboard. Naturally, it has its own hack uh, entry in the Hacker's Dictionary. This, this keyboard has seven shift keys. Control, Meta, uh, Super, Hyper, Upper and Greek. Uh, each, each key on it had uh, various subscripts on it that you could, you could type in Greek letters to, uh, with one key press, no, no pulling up a, a term, uh, uh, pulling up a, a character map to type things, just hit, hit the right shift key. Okay, so shift uh, these c the 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 shift key key builds the uh, artificial intelligence ones was quite small, where a one a terminal keyboards got larger and larger, and there's a significant size differential between them. Okay, so the Emacs uh, uh, Emacs was heavily influenced by by the Space Cadet keyboard. It, Emacs has a ridiculous number of key bindings. I was just looking at a, a fresh install and it has one and a half thousand key bindings by default. Even learning one key binding a day, it's going to take you four years to get through all of them. Uh, that's if you haven't forgot them, forgotten them uh, uh, after four years. So the worst thing about it is that there are many key bindings that are actually aren't even bound, uh, functions that are not even bound. So, so some people blame uh, their RSI on the finger stretching that's common in Emacs. There's even a term for this uh, called uh, little pinky syndrome. Some, some users try to reduce this by making the shift keys, such as control, easier to reach. Okay, enough of the history. Let's... Enough of the history, let's actually get on to, to modern keyboards. So you don't, you, you, so you, hundred and you want more keys. Well, uh, a good a good example of a keyboard with lots of keys is a pipe organ. Uh, in in this, the the stops are the logical equivalent of a function key, and what is different uh, is new is ha uh, that this uh, pipe organ has uh, key pedals, and so make. Okay, so, in a, in a, so anything to, uh, to reduce RSI, let's give foot pedals a try. Okay, uh, here's, I actually have this. Uh, this is uh, af after anything to get rid of RSI. I, I, desperation, I tried this out. Um, I, I settled on, uh, on four foot pedals in this arrangement here. Uh, surprisingly enough, you, it actually, I, the, the first comment from, from all the people is that, uh, that uh, it, you, it's got to be slower. In the end, uh, by the time you've, you've contorted yourself for, for various uh, uh, shift key con configurations, it's actually pretty fast. And with this particular arrangement, you can type all four shift keys at once. So you can have the, the so-called uh, quadruple bucky. All right. Okay, just back. Come on back. So, just a little bit of uh, for those people that are not familiar with keyboard matrix matrices, uh, shift keys on a keyboard are special. Uh, that sh shift keys have their own line. So, if you're going to design uh, to to reassign, uh, set up some key pedals, it's worth reusing uh, the the key codes and the lines. Uh, for the shift keys, and plus you don't need a uh, custom key map. <coughs> okay, let's sort with this. Sorry, I'm not used to this. Okay, so the comment about uh, modern keyboards being a hybrid. Modern keyboards they've been adding over time uh, shift keys, and latest Windows keyboards have um, up, up to at least six uh, shift keys. That's it. when it started off, the original keyboards had two shift keys, uppercase and control. Okay. So the, here's just a bit of, a bit of how to, how to build, 
build that. So it's the China phenomenon. Everything, everything's cheap. Uh, just as an, a, a, a um, just as a uh, advice, uh, solder use. Sorry. Sorry about flicking. Uh, that just solder it, solder it up, uh, and leave the the um, le leave the, the plugs on. Include a mouse while you're at it. There are some times where you need a mouse. Middle but mouse button is so so much fun. Uh, throw throw on the mouse into the project box, and it's easy to do. So we're talking about uh, the Tokyo Linux user groups. Um, uh, Conrad uh, Parker is an ex-slug president who moved to, to uh, Tokyo to do his PhD. Uh, one of the, his the little tiny little Unix utility that he, he has is Excel. Uh, Excel, I, f I find incredibly useful for munging uh, the command line. Uh, Paste buffer. Okay. Yes. Ah. So, shift. So, whilst shift keys are great, uh, I don't like mice. Uh, uh, you may as well use function keys as well. So, putting. So the great advantage of shift keys for Emacs is that Emacs has very few key bindings uh, to the function keys. And so that's a great thing that because uh, there are few, that set it, whilst you can rebind the keys, you go to somebody else's computer and it's completely different. Okay. So the, the comment here is, is simply about what the keyboards that I had last month, which were a set of IBM terminal keyboards that had an extra function keys. You tend to, l you keep on assigning uh, function keys. You can't, uh, if, if you're like me, you get the muscle memory s sets in uh, that you keep on running out of shift uh, uh, function keys. So another option is to is stick on key, uh, keys like this. Supposedly the commercial ones are, uh, have great productivity improvements. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Uh, one simple change is to uh, to remap caps lock to the control key. Um, I've not found it useful, but some people use it. One uh, again, last uh, I, I prefer uh, vintage keyboards that have uh, Alps keys and su such things. <coughs> they don't have Windows keys on them. I tend to repurpose the caps lock for as a Windows key. So this is just about the model, IBM Model M. The IBM Model M's a, a cute hack. It's really really on from the days when when the, the keyboards had individual key switches that were gold plated. The IBM Model M ha didn't have the gold plating, uh, but had a, a little tiny spring uh, in it instead. Okay. So just just an, a reminder that uh, the PS2 and AT connectors, the big big five pin ones, they're I electrically identical. You can plug it in. Uh, USB converters are, are easy enough to get, and that uh, there is one problem with it is that the uh, old IBMs use a lot of power, and to the ex that extent that uh, some people are uh, replacing the controller and putting a uh, a PIC or an AVR. Onto it. Okay, just to wrap up, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with other layouts such as Dvorak. Some people like it. Um, in the end, you get network effects. You go to somebody else's computer, and you can't use it. Yeah. On the really out there ways, the, there are other keyboards uh, from the simple, such as the uh, the split keyboards, to the Kinesis, which are actually a bowl keyboard that instead of being flat. And as a final point, 
uh, is is to look look at uh, cording keyboards. Now I've I've not played I, I've played to an extent with split <coughs> keyboards. I didn't find them useful. If I was going to try try something new, cording keyboards such as the st that stenographers use, to me ap appeal to me because of uh, the ability to use in, the, in a wearable setting. And that's it. How much have we done? Fifteen. Sorry for taking too much time. That's all right. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, that wraps up the talk. Um, Patrick, have you got any comments from your sick bed? Patrick, have you said anything? Oh, okay. All right. And do you want to say anything, Tim, in the wrap up? And the other thing was we didn't ask for any announcements at the start. Any announcements? Yep, I have announcements. Ah, uh, I'm going to steal your laptop again. Um, so, <coughs> who here likes Python? Um, there should be more of you. Um, <laughs> Python's an awesome uh, programming language and it's so awesome that I've run started running a conference all about Python um, it's called PyCon AU and it's here in Sydney um, it's happening in August it's a weekend conference it's the 20 and 21st um, it should be an awesome event um, it's dedicated totally to Python Python's worth missing Hawaii, I think. <laughs> um, we've announced our keynotes. Um, keynotes are going to be Rain, Raymond Hettinger, Mary Gardner, and Audrey Roy. Um, they've all got very interesting things to talk about. Um, we will have the schedule up very, very soon, so you'll be able to see all the awesome talks we have. This year we have a classroom track, so you can actually come along and um, have interactive learning, learn about how to use Python. If you're a beginner, excellent track to come along and play with. Um, we're definitely beginner friendly. We have lots of talks which will be of interest to beginners, but we're not just for beginners. Um, we have lots of deep technical talks as well. So there should be something for everyone. Um, definitely come along. Um, there's some other conferences Linux Australia runs. Um, and let's see. Their new website doesn't look very good on this thing. Yeah. Um, WordCamp Gold Coast. If anybody from the Gold Coast, you can go there and go to a WordCamp. WordCamp is basically a... Um, a event for WordPress. Um, lots of people use WordPress. Um, Drupal Down Under is next year in January. I believe that's in Melbourne. Um, if you can't get enough of PyCon, there's also PyCon in Z in um, New Zealand the week after PyCon. So you can come to PyCon AU, um, come to the sprints after PyCon AU, there'll be hacking sprints on Python stuff, and then head off to New Zealand and go into their PyCon, which should be an awesome tour. Um, I'd also like to thank Orion VM, um, the other people who are providing the hosting for um, the video streaming, so everybody on the video stream should be grateful of their, um, their providing the video encoding um, machine. Um, thank you all for coming to Slug. Um, does anybody else have announcements? Um, Shrita, come up. Uh, let's see if I can grab a new tab. Uh, um, who's heard of the Cannes Film Festival? Okay. Uh, Sorry, it's a bit of a long URL. Um, 
I was only only caught wind of this just before I left the office. So I thought it was pretty darn cool. Uh... Sorry, almost done. <laughs> <coughs> my phone <laughs> no my memory is not quite that good um, <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know me um, I'm the engineering manager at one laptop per child Australia and we're, we're trying to get hundreds of thousands of um, Linux based devices to children in remote Australia um, now I don't know why the formattings come out a bit strange but <clears throat> um, now there is an equivalent to the Cannes Film Festival for media, for um, for uh, marketing campaigns and that sort of thing, um, and we've won a bronze medal at that. Um, that was awarded the other day, um, and um, I thought that was pretty cool. We we worked with um, a range of organisations, including our so, uh, a couple of our major partners, Telstra and um, Droga Five, and a few others. But I won't. I'm not here to. I'm not here to pimp companies, but. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty good. So if you're if you're interested, head over. There's a there's a video thing over here that you can play. I haven't honestly, I haven't looked at it myself, but I'm sure it's great. Um, and I'll I'll post the full URL to the mailing list so that people actually can just click on it rather than typing that long rubbish I just typed in there. Um, any questions? <coughs> okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well done. I think uh, Tim wants you to finish the food, or in, I don't know if, they got, if anyone's going to the pub. Is there a pub? The PBH? All right, that's it. <laughs>